Oh, there you are. I'm back. Okay, good. Um, get the book, um, my so-called academic English writing manual, the PDF file I made available to you a while ago, and look at chapter 7. We are going to talk more about argumentation today, um, this session. Um, let's go to page 14, I think it's 114, or section 7.2, it's called Logical Arguments. And I'm looking at an order, earlier edition of my book. So, let's talk about a political example now, if you like politics. Um, right now it's kind of depressing, but okay, let, at least in my country and a lot of other countries right now it's pretty depressing, but okay. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about Trump. I know you're probably sick of hearing about him, and I am too. But it's a good example for an interesting issue that um, some writers have been, and even some scholars have been talking about for a while, since he first started running for president. Is Trump a fascist? Do you think, it's, it, do you think Trump is a fascist? Would he qualify as a fascist? I want you to pause the video for a minute and think about this, talk to somebody. What is a fascist? How would you define a fascist? And does Trump qualify as a fascist? Okay, uh, what do you think? Okay, uh, in the book we have several potential arguments. Um, Inductive and deductive, and actually the, the examples I gave before of like the one about Mars and radiation, and you could order it this way, so it's your main claim and then uh, your main argument that the radiation levels would be deadly, and then support, 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 uh, or claim, claim, claim. Um, that's kind of a deductive structure. You start with a, a statement and then you deduce. Uh, a conclusion, or you could flip it around and do like just premise, 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 therefore um, uh, the radiation levels would be deadly and uh, too deadly to, 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 you know, to send people there, something like that. That's kind of more of an inductive structure. So the inductive and deductive, they're kind of mirror images of each other, kind of. That's how I've always viewed them. Um, I don't see them as terribly different, it's just a different order. Um, uh, kind of a flipped or mirror image version of one another. So in the book, um, discussing the question, is Trump a fascist? And, and people have debated this in, you know, in, in some good uh, magazines that have been well thought out, pieces of writing uh, on both sides of the issues. Is he really a fascist? Mm, okay. Well, Take a look at the deductive and inductive argument for a minute, a couple of minutes, and discuss them. And then on the next page, there is something else, uh, what's called a best option or infer inferencing based argument. There are other names for it in philosophy um, that you can uh, see in the book. Um, there's a well known philosopher who came up with kind of a weird name for that kind of argument. I'll just call it kind of an inference based or best option or best choice argument. Which of these arguments is strongest? These represent several different positions on the issue of whether Trump is a fascist. Which one is the best argument? Which one do you find more convincing? So pause the video for a while. This is going to take a while. I, I want you to take a while to look at these and talk to somebody about these uh, and then we'll come back. And we're back. So if you've ever taken a course in logic or something like that, you probably maybe you did exercises with deductive and inductive arguments. But is that how we write in academic writing? Uh, especially if you're dealing with a complex issue like this, would your arguments be a simple deductive argument or a simple inductive argument? There are times where that might work. Uh, or where maybe part of your essay 
relies on inductive or deductive kind of argument, a traditional kind of logical argument, traditional syllogism um, like this, da da da, therefore, uh, conclusion. Well, it's a good question. Are, 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 do these work well for a complex issue like this? Let's look at the deductive argument. Did you think this was a good argument? Was it convincing? Generally, my students will say no. It's kind of simplistic. It doesn't consider the different possibilities. It doesn't consider maybe possible counter arguments. And that's a key idea. You've got maybe an argument or a claim and then counter claims or counter arguments. It can't really consider that. Uh, it's too simple a structure. So if you just do a simple deductive argument, if you don't consider other possibilities, you might come to kind of a bad conclusion. Trump is a fascist. Maybe it is, but it isn't really supported, I think, very well by these claims. Fascists do this. So it's trying to define what a fascist is and then saying, okay, Trump has done this and this and this, therefore he's a fascist. Is that persuasive? No, because there are maybe, there's maybe more to the question of what is a fascist and the question of whether he has maybe done some of these things to some degree, is that enough to make him a fascist? Um, a pure deductive argument might alone might not be enough to get you to a good conclusion. Let's look at the inductive argument. This seems a little bit better. Um, it, it's kind of looking more carefully at what is a fascist? What are some criteria for the fascist? Um, he has done things that are consistent with fascism. Therefore, he is probably a fascist. But the arguments and the evidence here, it, it's not strong enough to say he is a fascist. Um, it just uh, is cautiously, carefully concluding he is probably a fascist. But is that still correct? There are some people who would say no, because if you look at real fascists like Hitler and Mussolini, they were far worse than Trump. They actually killed a lot of people. Trump hasn't done that, not yet. Um, unless you consider all the people who died from coronavirus thanks to his leadership. <clears throat> okay, but that's not actually deliberately killing people by sending them to concentration camps. So there are people who would say, no, it kind of demeans the term fascist if you say that Trump is a fascist in the same sense as Hitler, because Hitler sent millions of people to death camps. Trump has done nothing like that. And there are people who say, well, he clearly is acting like a fascist. It's just that, you know, he's kind of, there are certain legal limitations on what he can do thanks to our constitution. Thank God we have a constitution in the U.S. like it, I mean, it has done a, it is doing a fairly good job of restraining him because the, our constitution does put some limits, a lot of limits on what he can do. Um, but even then the Congress, the Senate are still kind of letting him get away with stuff that he shouldn't. Uh, but that's a different question. Third one, the best option or inferencing based argument. Uh, do you think this was the best one? Usually my students will say yes. What are some reasons? Why do you think this is better? Well, it is considering different possibilities. It's considering arguments and counterarguments, or claims, counterclaims, uh, and then maybe a counter counterclaim. Um, uh, you can say that um, he has exhibited certain bits of these things that maybe define a fascist, but not to the full extent that you would expect with a Hitler or a Mussolini. Uh, when you look at his psychology, his psychology is more like a narcissist. Um, therefore, he comes to a cautious conclusion. He's not, probably not really a fascist, although he's dangerous. He's dangerous because he's a narcissist. Narcissists do tend to be authoritarian. Um, using their authority, their power too much. Um, but it's not quite a fascist. He has, he's dangerous because he's a narcissist and an authoritarian, um, not because he's a fascist. So it seems like a very cautious and well-balanced claim. So it is considered claims and counterclaims. It's considered different possibilities. And especially in the social sciences or maybe humanities, when you're dealing with complex issues, 
this is maybe a better argumentative strategy. Um, you you lay out arguments, claims, and you deal. You look at counterclaims. You look at evidence for this and evidence against this. You look at um, both sides. You look at an issue carefully, and this is especially necessary for any kind of complex issue, complicated issue, um, especially in social science and humanities fields. Now, let's say you read this essay. And it's a well-written essay, but you disagree with it. You think that he still is a fascist. You think that he should be considered a fascist. How would you argue against that? How would you argue, uh, well, he, he, well, here's one way you could make a counter argument to this essay. Um, you could say, well, he's a narcissist, yes, but narcissists become fascists. Given enough time, enough power, a narcissist will become a fascist. You look at Hitler, um, if actually if you look at the life of Hitler before he became, came to power, he was a narcissist. He showed clear narcissistic tendencies in his relationships. And being a narcissist, he seized power and he, tr and he did what he could to seize as much power as possible. Um, and at the time it was probably easier, a lot easier for him to do so. Uh, so you could argue, well, a narcissist will be, try to become a fascist. They'll do whatever they can to, be, to go, uh, to, to grow into the role of a fascist. Okay, so, and actually, the next arguments are going to try to do that. They're going to be, the next arguments are, are kind of variations on, or similar to the best inferencing kind of arguments. So I want you to look at the case-based arguments and the policy or principle-based arguments on the next two pages. And these are sort of variations or different flavors of the kind of inferencing-based arguments. Some are kind of more looking at case examples and some are kind of more looking at principles or policies um, in a similar way. I want you to look at these for a few minutes, discuss them. Uh, do you like these? Do you think these are good arguments? So talk about those and we'll come back. And we're back. Do you like these? Um, when you compare version A and version B, so the case-based arguments, and then um, 7.2.4, the policy or principle-based arguments, do you, do you like all of these? Um, is there one that you like better than the others? Do you have a, is there one you have a, is there one you like best, a favorite, and maybe one you like less so? Uh, what did you, what did you think? Um, these are maybe th uh, approaches to argumentation you could find in, say, a course in political science or policy studies, international studies. Uh, and I think these are all good arguments. It's kind of actually hard for me to pick a winner. I like them all, because you know, I wrote them. No, but I, I wrote them in order to be good examples of different approaches and maybe slightly different conclusions, but they're all maybe slightly different viewpoints. They represent maybe slightly different viewpoints or interpretation, but they are all kind of fairly well argued to some degree or another. They consider different possibilities. They consider different sides. They consider counter arguments or counter claims. Uh, so a fascist is this, um, and Trump has kind of done that, but he's not done that. He's not done it so far. Um, you can say av fascists uh, advocate violence and commit violence. Well, Trump has kind of advocated violence, so he's kind of a fascist, but he's not done it to really anything like what a fascist dictator would have done, like, you know, Hitler. So you consider, like, different arguments and counterarguments and say, okay, and even a counter-counter claim, counter-counter argument in order to come to the conclusion. So all of these conclusions here are valid. And that is, they follow logically from the different premises and the different claims and counterclaims that are considered. Uh, version A, so the case-based argument version A, 
Trump's situation is not analogous to that of actual past fascists, so we cannot conclude that Trump is a fascist in the true sense of the word. Um, it's a valid claim. Whether we agree with it or not, maybe you agree with it, maybe you don't, but it's a valid claim because it follows logically from the premises. And the premises are good because they've considered different possibilities. Version B, he thus exhibits fascist tendencies. And maybe you can go on to say he's dangerous because he exhibits fascist tendencies. He's not a real fascist, but he exhibits fascist tendencies. It's a valid argument. It follows logically from the different premises or claims and the claims and counterclaims that are, that are considered. The policy or principle-based arguments. This is a bit more kind of uh, you know, principle-based. Um, it goes into a lot of detail about different aspects of his behavior. Um, conclusion. Thus, with Trump, we're seeing clear fascist tendencies and a growing danger of more degrees or greater degrees of fascism in the U.S. the longer he stays in power. And God help us if he gets reelected. I hope not, but... Okay, I wouldn't normally get so political in a writing class. Um, normally, I criticize... I make fun of... You can tell my political views, but I do try to make fun of... Um, politicians on both sides. Uh, but this is a different example. This is a different case. Um, and in, in classes around the world, people are using Trump as an example for writing or for political analysis or for the psychology of narcissism. Um, a number of psychologists have actually looked at Trump and concluded he is probably a narcissist. And he, he really is. He really has shown narcissistic tendencies. A narcissist is a person who lives in their own reality. They don't care about what other people think. Uh, it's egoism to an extreme. Uh, and yes, Trump lies because a narcissist lies. A narcissist really has their own, a different perception of reality. And reality is, de <laughs> is really dependent on what they think at the time. Um, because reality will, their interpretation of reality will shift in order to protect their egos. And, and narcissists abuse other people. Um, they're abusive, they can be violent, and there are different varieties or flavors of narcissism. And these kind of people are bad and should be avoided. Uh, and I hope, I really hope you never have to work with a narcissist. Um, uh, not in my past job, but several jobs before that, I worked with a narcissist. That person was absolutely evil uh, and nasty and uh, I had to leave a job because of a narcissist who, narcissist who was actually in sort of power over me um, and I couldn't stay there I had to leave again it was not the previous school where I, that I just left my last job was a great job I loved it uh, I came here for um, even better opportunities and a better better job um, here um, as a tenure track professor, my last job I liked a lot, but it was a, several jobs before where I had a completely different school. Uh, my last job was Code, I really liked it there, uh, but it was a couple of jobs before that I worked with a narcissist and had to leave um, because of bullying. Narcissists like to bully. A common feature of narcissism is bullying, and I had to leave because of a bullying workplace environment. So I've worked with a narcissist. I kind of know what it's like, and Trump is narcissism to an extreme. So normally psychologists wouldn't just diagnose a public figure with as, as a narcissist or some other mental disorder. Um, the, normally a psychologist code of ethics would say we only diagnose somebody we've actually personally interviewed and um, run tests on or something, but this is a special case because this guy is the president and he's, his behavior and his actions uh, are a danger to people. So psychologists in the U.S. have m taken the unusual step of publicly stating that he is or probably is a narcissist, of trying to diagnose him, <clears throat> or at least using him in their classes when they teach psychology classes about uh, mental health problems. Say, this is the textbook case of a narcissist, maybe an extreme case of a narcissist, because he is a narcissist. And again, Sorry, I normally don't get so political, but this is kind of a unique case. Usually when we have like a presidential election, 
I'll make fun of both sides. Even though I clearly prefer one, I will make fun of both sides. Uh, and I will criticize Biden, by the way. I have some, I'm very critical of him in some ways, but I'm rambling, I digress. Okay. These are examples of kind of argumentation. It would be so much more fun if we could just do this in a real cl live class. Um, me talking all the time like this is kind of boring. Sorry about that. Uh, but this is the limitations we have right now this, this year. Uh, not just here, but around the world. Uh, next time, um, maybe I'll say a little bit more about counter-argumentation. And I'm going to give you um, an exercise. We talked in the last lecture about maybe a logical link that maybe is missing. And, um, and sometimes maybe it's missing and needs to be stated clearly. Some kind of a logical link that's missing. Next time I'm going to give you an exercise. I'm going to wait because you're still busy with your other Google form, your midterm preparation, the Google form for your midterm preparation for your, you're supposed to sketch out your thesis and your main ideas. Um, so I'm going to wait for you to finish that. And then I'm going to give you uh, a handout that kind of recaps a little bit of what I talked about here. And, um, and another exercise is going to be kind of a, um, a multi-part Google form where I'm going to ask you to identify some logical links. So kind of a nice logic exercise. Uh, and then I'll give you like a due date for the midterm. And if it seems like we're behind, we're not. Right after this, we're going to talk a little bit about citation systems. I can go with that pretty quickly uh, while you're doing your midterm. And then uh, we will start talking about something called a genre analysis um, after the midterm, or maybe about the time you're finishing it and I'm still lecturing. Um, along the way, maybe I'll talk about some style issues um, somewhere, maybe fit that in somewhere. Uh, but we're gonna do something called genre analysis. Don't worry, I'll explain it later. So anyway, good luck in your homework, enjoy your homework. I'll give you another little Google Form exercise maybe next time. Um, enjoy your weekend and the holiday, and I will see you next week. Goodbye.